What's good? My name is Mark, a.k.a. Mr. Mars Today. Um, well, I have to credit a music teacher from when I was like four till 12, this guy Doug Kudkin, and he really, uh, he really kind of like inspired me to be musical, and I've always been doing some kind of music. Before hip-hop, it was like singer-songwriter, acoustic guitar, rap, sublime kind of stuff, and then I moved eventually towards hip-hop, and then eventually towards like neo-soul and R&B, and that's kind of where I'm centered now, a little bit more. Having an older brother was like my introduction into hip hop music because whatever he was listening to, I was listening to. Um, and at the time, even though we were from the West Coast, he was really into the East Coast stuff. So I was listening to a Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, um, Black Moon, you know, uh, Lost Boys, all this stuff kind of from, from over in that region. And that was really, I think, my first introduction. And because I came from like a musical background, to me, that Tribe Called Quest had, and you know, that De La Soul, they all had that music in there and they all had that vibe. So. That was kind of my earliest introduction. And then also the radio around here, Cameo, back in the day before it was Clear Channel, was actually, like, dope as hell. Um, and they would play local artists. I remember Freaks of the Industry was my super-duper jam back in the day, even though it was, like, bleeped out every other word on the radio. Radio was a bit more friendly for local artists and actually supporting folks who were doing stuff around here in the Bay Area. So that was kind of my first taste of the Bay Area stuff is when I started listening to the radio. I mean, to me, I always look for artists that are able to complete a full record, not just singles. So nowadays, everything's so single-based, and there's some great singles out there, but who's capable of producing an album? Um, so in the last few years, folks like um, you know Kendrick Lamar, folks like Ayomari and Tehran from down in L.A., um, those kind of those those two artists in particular stand out to me because they were able to craft records that I can fuck with from beginning to end or at least only flip through a couple cuts as opposed to like, you know, this is my jam and then I go to track eight, that's my jam and that's it. Um, so, you know, I think I, to me there's so much rap, the world is flooded with rap right now, everyone's a rapper, and good is not good enough as far as I'm concerned. If I'm, if I'm trying to be your fan, I need you to be great, straight up. I need you to like work at it just endlessly until you're better than everyone else and then I'll hop on board. What really separates me is, is the team that I have and the folks that I'm willing to reach out to. Um, when I first started producing, I was very like egotistical, like I want to play the keys, I want to play the bass, I want to play the drums, and and I think in the and that's really what what hindered me from achieving great products, because in my eyes I was like it's only mine if I do everything. Um, nowadays I'm much more in the in the line of thinking like a Quincy Jones type producer, where I'm like, well, what's gonna make this track amazing? Maybe it's bringing in this other producer that's going to help me make the drum slap in, in a certain way. Or maybe it's bringing in a horn section and helping arrange a horn section that's really going to separate this track. Um, or it's a string section. So for me, I'm the kind of guy who I'll sit there for thousands of hours and not ever release something until I feel it's right. Um, so I think that's what separates me in a sense is that I'm, I'm willing to work incredibly hard to get something great as opposed to good. I don't want to release good stuff. Good stuff is... That was years ago for me, and I'm trying to only sit on the stuff until it, until I get everyone's ears on it. Everyone says that shit's amazing, then I'm like, okay, we could put that out. If you live your life like I do, then you dedicate 99% of your time towards the art, um, and when you do that, it's hard to make money unless you're selling your art, and that's not really ever been my goal. I'm more of the guy. I'd rather work. I do a couple nonprofit gigs. I do. Um, I teach music production after school for a couple classes. I do men's like support groups at a continuation high school. I'd rather do that stuff to make money and save all my creative energies for myself and the artists that I believe in. Um, so in the end, that leaves me with very part-time labor and very full-time music, and it's a struggle to make ends meet. Um, that and, you know, I think whenever you put hyper-focus on one element in life, then everything else suffers. I don't kick it with my friends enough. I don't make enough time for my lady. Um... I got a little belly that I didn't used to have because I sit in front of a, t you know, a, a screen all day. My neck is like constantly in pain. And these are kind of the things that I endure to push my craft forward. At some point I realize it's not, it's not a healthy lifestyle, but it's healthy for my art. So in a sense, I'm sure at some point in my life I'll have to balance back out and become a more well-rounded human being. But for right now, I'm just like hyper-focused. I just want to make, make the best music possible. I mean, I think the biggest challenge is having other people not necessarily believe that this is the a smart lifestyle to choose. Um, so family members, I mean, I get great support from my from my parents, but, you know, uncles and aunts and cousins and all that, they're like, oh, you're still doing that, huh? How's that working out for you? So I think the, the biggest challenge for me has to come to a point where I, 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 I just have to block all the naysayers and just believe in what I'm up to. Um, and I feel like I've gotten to that point where I'm actually like into the music that I make now. You know, 10 years ago I made music and 
it wasn't stuff that I would have listened to. It wasn't stuff that I would have like passed off to my friends like this is that new jam. It was just I loved it because I made it, and I think now I love it a little bit more because it's actually something that I would put in my CD player when I'm in the car or you know pass off to a friend and say hey, this is something that I really like. So I think that's probably the challenge has just been pushing forward to get to a place where I actually enjoy it, and then I can feel justified in in negating everything else in my life to make this. I mean, I think more importantly than remembering me is having my music be timeless and something that um, that can be enjoyed by a 15-year-old or a 60-year-old. And maybe that's what separates me in a sense as well from other producers is I'm not trying to make music just for now. I'm trying to make music that would have sounded good 20 years ago and that's going to sound good 20 years from now. Um, so I think if anything, what I'd like to be remembered for is just that I'm a producer that's willing to do whatever it takes to make something amazing and really tries to put together cohesive albums.